I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. If, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then grab one of the Bibles in the pew, look just like this one, turn to page 1053, and you will find Matthew 23 in our text for today. And if you don't have the Word of God and you want to read it, then take one of those with you. We want you to have a Bible and uh, let it change your life. Uh, hey, uh, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but we have Saturday night services too. Uh, it just looks a little crowded from where I'm sitting. And, uh, and if it doesn't look crowded from where you are or it doesn't feel crowded, great. But uh, I'm just going to give you a little secret. We have the same service, same music, same uh, message, same great kids stuff, and way better parking. Uh, just going to tell you, 4.30 and 6, but if you really want good parking, come at 6 o'clock. It's the least crowded of all of our services. And, and if some of you are thinking, well, that would just be weird, hey, just do it for a season until we're in the new building uh, sometime in early 2016. Uh, just help us out, and uh, you, better for you, better for uh, <laughs> the people who want to crowd in on, at 9.30. Hey, is anyone uh, excited about Christmas? All right. Some of you are, some of you aren't. That's okay. Hey, we've got something for both groups, okay? If you're excited about Christmas and you're ready for, uh, you know, just to celebrate like crazy, then this Thursday and Friday, we are doing the Calvary Christmas Musical. And it's at 7 o'clock both nights, and uh, you're welcome to come, and it'll it just join in the celebration because you're already excited about Christmas. Now, if you're not excited about Christmas, you're like, yeah, whatever, then we've got something for you as well. This Thursday and Friday at 7 o'clock is the Calvary Christmas musical, because apparently you need it. Uh, and so you can come and get ready for uh, celebrating Jesus' birth. Uh, and by the way, there's, a, there's still a few tickets uh, left if you want to invite your friends. You don't need a ticket to get in. It's just come in and attend. But it's a great way to invite your friends and neighbors. Uh, if put something in their hand, they can remember it by. Uh, so you're excited about Christmas. Who's already got their tree up? Okay, lots of hands go up. I don't want to ask what's wrong with the rest of you, but anyway. Uh, so you got lights on the house? Who's got lights on their house? Yeah. We have lights on our house, but that's because I love my wife. Uh, and uh, I mean, I love them, but you know. And all right, let's just be honest now. How many of you decorate the pet? How many of you put stuff on your dog? You know, that kind of, are you not gonna, no one confessed this service. We've had people confessing last night, so... Uh, because uh, we, sometimes we need to pray for the pets. But, uh, you know, I, I love the season. I love the Christmas decorations in here. We've got some great people who come in and make it explode Christmas in the sanctuary. And, and I just love that. I think it's, it's awesome. And it and just kind of helps put us in that celebratory mood. Uh, and I love driving home this time of year at night. You guys like that? You drive by the houses with the lights on them, and, and you see those. And I mean, and our house has, you know, just like kind of a, a nice, you know, a little bit of light, a few trees and stuff like that. But I love the people who go nuts, you know, because I mean, that's what I think I would want to do, only without the work part. And uh, I'm like, yeah, that's what my house to look like, the Griswold Christmas. You know, there it is. Just lights everywhere. And I think that's awesome. But sometimes when I'm driving by and I'm looking at those lights, I'm thinking that looks so cool. I have to wonder, is there as much joy on the inside as there is on the outside? Because uh, the first thing I want to challenge you with today is that we face the temptation of an externally focused life. We face the temptation of an externally focused life. Uh, the temptation is to put the emphasis on how it looks. Uh, so the house can be beautiful, the tree can be exquisite, the candles can be lit, the house, you know, all the decorations are up, and yet everyone in the house can be angry at each other or intoxicated. <laughs> or, or, well, that, yeah, that does play into both. <laughs> but if we're honest, it's not just Christmas, but our entire culture is obsessed with how things look. Uh, for instance, social media. People put stuff on there, and they, they track to see how many people like what I posted on there. And, and, and it's almost like we're starting to live life by uh, how we want to post it rather than how we want to live it. I'm convinced there are people who take vacations. They don't actually want to go that place. They just think it look really cool on Facebook. 
I think people do stuff that I don't really want to do that, but I'll make my friends jealous if I post it. So, you know, people are living their life uh, by how to post it rather than how to live it. And, and it's because they're externally focused. And it's not just social media. We fixate on our physical appearance as well. And so there's some people who work out obsessively. Now, I'm not opposed to working out. Health is good. You got to take care of yourself and everything. But, you know, they can't stop there. They got to crave the perfect abs, you know. They got to have the biceps that bulge. They got to have the glutes that look good, you know. And, and so they, you know, it, it, they focus on that. And so our society, because we're so physically driven, first time in history that people are starving themselves to look a certain way. Uh, you know, that, that's not a condition that happens in third world countries. It, 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 the, oh, I've got to be thinner. And in fact, now they have identified an a eating disorder that uh, it's unhealthy if you just consume healthy foods. And they find that people are killing themselves trying to eat healthy. Uh, and it doesn't stop there because then we've got all the cosmetic surgery augmentation stuff, right? So we can have the perfect lips, breasts, butts, tucks, lifts, all that kind of stuff that goes in. And that's before we even touch on the dental and the hair and the clothes and the nails. Oh, sorry, just stepped on toes. And uh, <laughs> because we're fixated on the externals. But it's not just the secular world. If we're honest, it happens in church world too, doesn't it? Because we come to church and we want to look good. We want to have the perfect family and the perfect marriage. And yet I know that... Uh, a lot of us driving here, we're having arguments in the car, and we get out of the car, and we slam the door, and we're like, okay, everybody put on the smiles and be happy, because we want to be spiritually presentable, and we do crazy things. You know, we learn church language and phrases, and so we start, you know, well, bless you, brother, and hallelujah, and praise the Lord, and, and, and that kind of stuff that we never say when we're not here. And people come in from the outside, and they go, these people talk funny. Or we put annoying bumper stickers on our cars. Do you remember the stuff in the 70s, like, you know, about the rapture? In case of rapture, this car will be driverless and, and stuff like that. Or we are superficially spiritual on social media. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to rant just for a moment, and I'm going to offend some people when I do this, so just go ahead and give me grace right now. But can we please stop posting, if you love Jesus, share this? Okay. Uh, I just got to tell you, uh, I'm rebellious to the core. And so if you tell me I have to do something or I don't love Jesus, I'm not doing it, even if it's a good thing. And, and, uh, and by the way, Jesus never said, if you love me, post it on social media. <laughs> he said, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, love other people. You know, that, that's kind of the, the real test, not share this on social media, and, and, uh, and, and by the way, God's not keeping score. He's not going to bless you because you share something on social media. So into our externally focused world, both in the church and without, Jesus speaks to our temptation to live that externally focused life. Uh, Matthew 23 is the passage I want us to look at. 27 and 28 are the verses um, I want to focus on. But let me just tell you about this passage. This is the harshest passage in the Gospels. It is Jesus blasting the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the scribes, the people who were the, the standard for spiritual excellence. These were the people that were looked up to. These were the people that were uh, considered uh, spiritual. Uh, and, and so he's addressing them. And you ought to go home and read this entire chapter because it... It kind of conveys how disappointed and angry Jesus is and how they approach life from an external focus. So listen to verses 27 and 28, Matthew 23. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You see, the truth is we can look great on the outside and be dying on the inside. 
We can look great on the outside, and, and, and the inside is disgusting. That was the Pharisees. That, that's what Jesus is talking about. He says, you're externally spiritual. They studied the scriptures. They, they learned them. They prayed publicly. They kept the law, even though the law was more their law than God's law. They were like, we're going to keep this so we can be honoring to God. And they were respected in public. They were given places of honor. You know, people considered them, uh, well, better than they were. And yet, they were dead on the inside. Whitewashed tombs. They were spiritually corrupt and rotting because they looked good on the outside but were dead on the inside. And can I just confess, that was me about 2002. 2002, I'd been at pastor at Calvary for 10 years and, and everything looked like it was going great. I mean, my family was great. The church was doing well. I mean, we'd grown from like, you know, 90 people to about uh, 400 people. And, and so we were being successful. And, and, and yet to get there, you know, uh, we'd had conflict because there was lots of change and everything. And, and I hadn't ever learned how to, you know, establish healthy boundaries. And I was just exhausted. I was burned out. And it hit me when uh, I started noticing that... Uh, well, I didn't care about playing golf. By the way, if you don't know me, golf is my hobby. I, I love to play golf. And, and I woke up and I was like, I don't care if I play golf. I noticed that there wasn't the joy that I have with my kids. Uh, and I love my kids. I'll be with my kids. I'll play with my kids. And, and I was just like, yeah, it's, don't care. I was numb to life. And that was when I took my very first sabbatical month off. And by the way, if you don't know this, all the senior pastors here at Calvary, we, we get a sabbatical every five years so that we can refresh and renew and, and come back ready to do ministry. And so during that month off, I reconnected with God. I reordered my life. I, I discovered my passion again and built healthy boundaries. It changed my life. And, and, and uh, But here's the thing. This morning, I know that there's some of you that are feeling what I was feeling then. I mean, you might look great to your friends and family. They, they, they might think you have it all together. They might think you're doing well. But you know that on the inside, you are withering. I mean, maybe it's your marriage. Um, you know, maybe the, the, it's just drying up. The fire's dying out. The embers are cold. Maybe it's your kids and, and your relationship with them. Maybe it's your hobbies or your job. But life has lost its luster. There's no joy, and you're just numb. And, and you've been working hard to keep up the appearances. But you know on the inside, you're burned out. You're exhausted. And if that's you, whether a little bit or a lot, I just want you to know there is hope. And his name is Jesus. Because Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's the one who refreshes our souls. He's the one who renews our lives. He's the one who, who lifts us up and helps us to focus on the things that are healthy. But here's the reality. The first step to health, the, the beginning of, of recapturing your joy and your life again, starts with admitting that you've been living with a wrong focus, that you've been focused on the externals rather than the internals. So today, the, the rest of the message, I want us to talk about how to build a healthy internal life. How to build a healthy internal life. Now, understand, this is just a beginning. It's not comprehensive. It's, uh, uh, it's just a, a starting point. It's foundational, if you will. But we're going to talk about how to build a healthy internal life. And, and if you are in a place where you are drowning on the inside, you need immediate help, then talk to one of the pastors after the service. Set up an appointment with a counselor. Talk to somebody who can help you uh, keep from drowning. So how to build a healthy internal life. Uh, that's the next point. There we go. Uh, so how do we do this? Let me share a couple of keys. Just a couple of, of thoughts that, are, again, are foundational principles that if you really want to have a healthy internal life and not just be a whitewashed tomb, th this has got to be part of it. The first key is value character over appearances. 
Value character over appearances. Uh, This is rebelling against the culture of external worth. After all, Paul says, Do not be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, we've got to be different. We don't want to just conform to what the society says, the standard that we've seen. We want to live a different life. So we've got to rebel against that culture and value character over appearances. Now, here's the funny thing. Everybody, if you talk to them about character, everybody's a big fan of character. Right? If you talk to individuals, character is important. You talk to churches, character. Oh, we're all about character here. You talk to businesses, they claim that they value character. And the truth is, um, for most of us, it's just words. It's just words. Uh, Here, I'll start with churches. That's the world I know the best. Uh, And honestly, churches are notorious for judging by externals. So here's the reality. You can go into most churches in this country, and if you just show up week after week after week, and you dress appropriately, and you carry a Bible, and you give them some money, and you say amen, and you smile a lot, people will decide that you are spiritually mature, and they will put you in charge of other people. That's the truth. The sad truth, because you just might be mean and judgmental and angry. You might be a predator or an embezzler. You might be somebody who's power hungry or divisive. But you looked good, so we promoted you. Now, the truth is, all of us can be guilty of judging by appearances, right? You know when I'm most tempted to judge by appearances? When I'm sitting in an airport. (laughs) You guys do that too? You're sitting there, you're waiting for the plane to be called, you know, and you're like... You and your wife or you and your husband, you're like, hey, look at them. Look at that. You guys do that? Because I have to repent every time I fly. And uh, (laughs) so we can all be guilty of judging by appearances. So so what I want to do is I want to ask you some questions to help you evaluate you. To see if you really are truly valuing character. And this is really important. Uh, because of the words that Jesus said just before our passage this morning. Look back at verses 25 and 26. Listen to how important it is to get this whole character piece right. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. He says, you got to start on the inside. So let me ask you four questions that give you an opportunity to evaluate you on the inside. And and I hope these are questions that you will think about throughout the week. Maybe that you'll talk about with your family, your friends, your life group, uh, uh, just some people that, that can help you process this. Here you go, four character questions for you to evaluate you. First of all, is your home filled with love or conflict? Is your home filled with love or conflict? Matthew 22, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In John 13, he said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And and so often we kind of look at that passage and we go, okay, I got to love the strangers out here. And maybe I got to love the people at church, you know, be polite and kind to them and stuff like that. No, love begins in our homes. Because if you're not loving the people that you live with, that you share life with, that are closest to you, then that other stuff doesn't really matter. So is your home filled with love or with conflict? Um, If you're not sure, what's more prevalent, laughter or anger in your household? Second question, is communication encouraging or accusing? When you talk, are you encouraging the people who hear you, or are you accusing them? Are there, you know, an abundance of always and nevers in your speech? Like, you always do that, and you never do this. That's accusation. When when you're having a conversation with your spouse and children, is it really a conversation, or is it an interrogation? See, Ephesians chapter 4, Paul said, Let no unwholesome words come out of your mouth but only that which builds up those who hear, that it may benefit those who listen. Earlier in the chapter, he says, speak the truth in love. One of my favorite Proverbs is Proverbs 12, 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. 
So how's your communication, encouraging or accusing? Third question, is forgiveness the rule or the exception in your life? Again, in Ephesians 4, Paul said, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You see, forgiveness is one of those foundational traits of followers of Christ. Are we living lives of forgiveness or are we holding grudges? Are you always bringing up the past? Are you reminding people of their failures and their mistakes and how they betrayed you and let you down? Or are you living in grace and moving on? And if you're not sure, just, you know, if I just ask you the question, who are you mad at right now? Who do you not want to be with right now? Uh, probably a face or name or bunches of people will pop into your head. <laughs> be aware of your heart because if you're unforgiving then it's going to damage your soul, and that's a character piece that we can't get around. So is your home filled with love or conflict? Is communication encouraging or accusing? Is forgiveness the rule or exception? Fourth question of character, am I living a generous or a selfish life? You know, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we kind of nod our heads and say, yeah, it's more blessed to give than to receive, but is that how we live? Is that our actions? Do we get excited about giving or do we just give when we're backed into a corner? Is it an act that we do occasionally where we are generous in the moment or is generosity a lifestyle that we have? You see, we need a vibrant, growing relationship with Jesus in order to have the character of Christ, in order to have a healthy internal life. When was the last time you asked God to help you become the person that he created you to be? You see, most of the time when we pray, whether we ask people to pray for us or whether we're just praying ourselves, we, we tend to ask God to fix problems, right? God, my, my family is sick, heal them. God, we, we, we need money to pay the bills, provide the money. God, uh, there's, there's a broken relationship, we want you to, to fix the family here, we want to heal this. And, and those are all legitimate prayers. Understand, God wants you to bring your problems to him and ask him to, to help fix them, but when was the last time you prayed something like this? God, grow me into the person that you want me to be. God, change my heart, change my actions, change my behaviors. Show me where I'm stumbling. I want to be your child that brings honor to you. You see, that's a character-driven prayer. A healthy internal life begins when we value character over appearances. The second key is we got to live to please God, not people. Live to please God, not people. Um, one of my life verses is Galatians 1.10. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's just a verse that's going to help you live for Christ. The Apostle Paul says, For am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Strong words, isn't it? Strong words. He says, look, I, I got to live for God's approval if I'm going to be a servant of Jesus. And as a natural born people pleaser, that's a lot easier said than done. You realize, I mean, I'm one of those middle children that wants everyone to get along. Because if they're not, I'm going to get hurt. And I, I just, want, <laughs> just want us to get along. And most of us want to be liked and accepted and included, don't we? I mean, we kind of don't want to be excluded and disliked and hated. And here's the thing, if you really want to be liked, accepted, and included, then this will happen if you live to please God. Maybe not with some of the people that you want to be liked by, maybe not included in some of the groups that you want to be included by, but if you're living to please God and you are connected to a family of faith, then you're going to be surrounded by people who are championing you on and encouraging you to live for Christ. Maybe not 100%, but the majority of them will want you to, to serve God and follow God and listen to God's voice. That's why we encourage you to connect here at Calvary. So how do we please God? Because it's really easy to say, is your life pleasing to God? Let me just mention a couple of things. First of all, if you want to please God, you got to be honest. you got to be honest. Jesus hates hypocrisy. You read Matthew 23, the whole thing, and you hear his, his just 
frustration, his anger at this lifestyle of hypocrisy that is embraced by the spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel. And he, and he can't stand it. And, and he calls them out. And he, and he says, you're whitewashed tombs and you're eating out of filthy cups. And, and he says, at one point, you're a brood of vipers. You're a pit of snakes. That's how bad it is. He, he despises hypocrisy. So be honest about who you are. That's why I tell you all the time, hey, look, I'm a sinner, and I know it. I fail often. I deserve hell. Now, the good news is that Jesus forgives me, and, and I get heaven even though I deserve hell, and God forgives me and restores me when I fail. So be honest. So who are you honest with? Is there a group of people in your life, someone that you can really be gut level honest about your struggles and about your failures and about who you are? That, see, we all need godly, encouraging friends. By the way, that's why we want you to connect to a life group. So that you can be surrounded by people who are on this journey of life with you and, and they will love you and encourage you and get to know you enough that they will encourage you to be real. By the way, if you're newer to Calvary, uh, please, uh, we don't want you to feel any pressure to try to uh, pretend or put your best foot forward or, or to hide uh, who you really are. Because I know that dynamic happens in churches. You know, you come in, you don't want people to think you're, you're a loser, and, and so you try to put the best foot forward and you try to pretend you got your act together. Hey, let me just tell you something. We know you don't have your act together. Okay, because I don't have my act together. And nobody around you has their act together. We're all strugglers on this journey. So please don't spend all that energy trying to pretend like, you know, it's all good. See, here's how I look at it. I told you I'm a sinner. And, and, and so I just consider that everybody in this room is only half as bad as Chad Garrison. So you people are really sick. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you are messed up. Because I know that, just, just half as bad, you, you're, you're in trouble. So we're all in this place together, so why would we pretend? Why, why would we step into that place where hypocrisy calls our name and wants us to own that lifestyle when Jesus calls us to be honest? And by the way, when you confess who you really are, it frees you from those sins. See, it's when you hide those sins that they own you. Because you're worried that someone's going to find out. Hey, look, the only way to, to have freedom is go ahead and confess them, name them, and, and let people help you overcome them. That's what Jesus wants to do in your life today. So be honest. If you're going to live for God and not for people, be honest. And then be obedient. Be obedient. I mentioned this earlier. John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So simple, so plain, so difficult. And by the way, when he says keep my commandments, he doesn't just mean the ones you like. Because <laughs> we, you know, in churches, we kind of like talk about the, the things that, that we like to enforce, but we ignore the ones that, you know, we, we indulge in. No, it, keep them all. And so here's my conviction. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then that means God the Holy Spirit is in you, and that means that right now he's already convicting you. You know that voice inside of you that says you shouldn't do this? That's the Holy Spirit. The voice inside of you that says start doing this? That's the Holy Spirit. And so I don't have to go to your life and say, hey, you should stop doing this and start doing that because the Holy Spirit's already there teaching you and you need to listen to him because he wants to lead you to life. He wants you to be obedient to God so that you can live to please God so that you are healthy on the inside and not worried about what other people think about the outside. So are you... Are you obedient to God in your relationships? Are you obedient to God in your morality? Are you obedient to God in your habits and your speech? Are you living to please Jesus or are you living to please people? And may I point out that you're a people. And so if you're living to please yourself, you're not living to please Christ. 
See, I pray today that you would choose to build a healthy internal life. Because if you don't build a healthy internal life, then you are like your Christmas tree decorating your house. A lot of you already have your tree up. How many of you are like me and you have artificial tree? Okay, that's right, artificial trees. We have this big, beautiful artificial tree. It has lights already on it. Thank you, God. <laughs> that is evidence of grace that there are pre-lit Christmas trees because a lot of you remember trying to put the lights on a, a, a tree and, and you wouldn't get it right or one strand would go out. And it's just like evil. <laughs> but here's the thing. You have an artificial tree, and what that means is that your Christmas tree is fake. It's fake. It's not real. And here's the thing. If we live externally focused lives, we will end up fake. How many of you have real trees? Okay, that's right. The purists are in here. It's nothing like walking into a house with a real Christmas tree, right? And the smell, and you just go, you want to breathe it in, and go, ah, oh, that's beautiful. That is awesome. And, and when they're really big and green, you're just like, that is such a beautiful tree. But the reality is, it's dying. You cut it off, boom. I mean, it's slowly withering in your living room, right before your eyes. Basically, it's decomposing in your house. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and if you are unhealthy on the inside, then you're withering too. If you're not grounded in Jesus, then you're dying. You see, Jesus came to give us life. Abundant life, eternal life, real life it doesn't happen when we're living an externally focused life. So how's your life today? I pray that it is much more than just decorated on the outside. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us and giving us life. Life in Jesus. We don't deserve it, but you have blessed us abundantly. You have called us to, to embrace you and to live for you. And God, you want to change us. So today, let us hear your voice. Uh, Lord, speak into our lives. Let us amplify the Spirit's conviction so that we can change as your servants. So that we can be healthy people of God. So that we can live as sons and daughters of God, serving this world and representing you. We cannot do this on our own. We need you. So today, Lord, we just give ourselves to you, asking that your will would be done in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship our God together.